All right, everyone. So welcome to our event today. My name is Jason Grillo. I'm the uh, event director for Air Miners, and it's a pleasure to see somebody here today on a on a topic that is uh, near and dear to all of us. Um, wanted to uh, get through a, a couple of reasons why we're having our uh, hosting our event today. One, uh, I guess very tactically, uh, this is what our community elected to have. Uh, so we had a poll not so long ago about what topic we would want to put forward for our next Air Miners panel event. And what bubbled to the top was something about carbon storage. And I think that reveals uh, something about the about the industry that uh, has been a, you know, a bit of a long time coming that, you know, that uh, certainly there are hundreds of, you know, one and two and three person startups out there. Uh, working to draw the carbon dioxide out of uh, draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and that's great. Uh, but there's this whole supportive infrastructure of other aspects of the carbon removal ecosystem that have yet to be built out. Uh, it's exciting how much opportunity it is. It's a little, you know, and and it's a area that has a lot of kind of blank space, uh, which is open for discussion and development. Of uh, new industry in, uh, of entirely new business. It's one of the supporting pieces of, as, as I said, supporting pieces of infrastructure, similar to say MRV or uh, regulatory uh, services, professional services, you know, market research, legal services, et cetera, et cetera, that are going to have to be built out specific to carbon removal, so that we can achieve a gigaton scale. Um, so we can achieve gigaton scale as rapidly as possible. So um, I'm going to introduce you all to Sylvain Delers in a minute, who's our moderator, who will uh, take it away. We have a very esteemed panel of, of, of guests that uh, uh, would like to, we'll, we'll get to uh, in good time. But a couple of housekeeping items first. One, uh, yes, this is, event is being recorded. It will be on our Air Miners YouTube channel in a few days. Uh, one, two, thank you all, first of all, for coming and also uh, to our panelists and also to those of you who contributed uh, voluntarily uh, to make today's car uh, event a carbon negative event. Yay! Uh, so that's uh, extremely important for us to be able to practice what we preach. Um, finally, a uh, little bit of a run of show. Like I said, I'll hand it over to, hand it over to Sylvain shortly. We'll hear some remarks from Dr. Claire Nelson and then on to panel discussion. And then uh, Q&A at maybe 45 minutes, uh, 40, 45 minutes after the hour. Take that to uh, the top of the hour uh, to 10 a.m. Pacific when we'll stop the recording, stop the Zoom. Uh, this is, sorry, stop the recording, continue with the Zoom. And feel free to hang on at that point for networking. Uh, we'll keep the Zoom open for another half an hour after that. Do not feel obligated to stay. We're all extraordinarily busy. But it's, all, it's a really nice way of getting to know each other, not just know of each other. The semantics make sense. So with that, I uh, just wanted to say once more, uh, really appreciate your taking the time and energy to be with us today and want to hand it over to our moderator, Savane Delers. Savane. Thank you, Jason. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Airminers, for creating this space to review the status and perspectives of uh, CO2 permanent storage today with a great panel. Um, so today we want to explore the last part of the CCS and CDR value chains, the permanent CO2 storage. So this is where we want to get rid of CO2, hopefully forever or close to. And um, yeah, so a lot is going on uh, for CCS and direct air capture in the startup space, investment. But uh, at some point, yeah, the question is, what would we do with those gigatons of CO2 captured every year? hopefully soon, you know, where to put it. And I guess uh, when is also a large part of the question because the timing is key to align between the capture uh, sector and the storage sector. We want to explore that today. And I think it's also more than a practical question because investors putting money in uh, carbon removal uh, companies now should pay attention to the end of life of CO2. Because if we anticipate that at some point shortage, uh, sorry, storage uh, may become a supply constraint, uh, investor may ask themselves the question: Has the company I'm investing in secured an access to enough storage capacity to fulfill the growth plan they are presenting? So, with that, I want to hand the floor to Claire Nelson. 
Claire uh, has uh, done her PhD uh, researching on basalt weathering in Iceland, and she's now a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University. She has also been involved uh, as an expert reviewer for the X Prize, uh, and she has been a consultant for uh, Sustaria, uh, science advisor for Carbon Direct, and recently she is a co-founder of a new carbon storage company, which will be very interesting for today's topic. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Claire. Thank you, Sylvan, and thanks, Jason, for organizing and everyone for being here. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a bit of a background on what is carbon storage um, and what are the different kind of overview of the different technologies before we get into our panel discussion. Um, so everyone in this room is probably familiar with carbon capture and storage and um, as Sylvan and Jason both mentioned, the capture and storage are, for the most part, separate technologies. There's kind of a middle ground with enhanced weathering and ocean alkalinity enhancement that can serve as both capture and storage, two birds with one stone. Um, but today I'm going to mostly talk about in situ carbon storage, which means putting CO2 underground, hopefully forever, because that's kind of um, the most relevant with these panel speakers here, since it's what we all do. Um, so quickly for the capture part, a lot of the different capture mechanisms, whether it's um, kind of taking advantage of photosynthesis using like bioenergy capture and storage or BECs or bikers um, or engineered capture like direct air capture or the calcium magnesium looping um, or even emission source capture. So just uh, carbon uh, mitigation, I guess, rather than removal. Um, all of these things rely on access to permanent and large scale storage. Um, so what are these storage mechanisms? I am a geochemist, so I like to break them into the basically the phase at which carbon is stored. So what version of carbon are you putting underground? Um, and this not only makes sense to me, but it's also relevant in terms of the permanence and the monitoring and verification techniques. Um, so for one, um, basically we can put pure phase CO2 underground, which means just pure CO2, nothing else. Um, and generally how this works is it's compressed at the surface to a liquid or supercritical state. Um, and then this compressed pure CO2 is put underground either into old oil reservoirs or in porous saline formations, so like porous sandstones, for example. And um, it's trapped underground, mostly by a structural mechanism, meaning there's some geologic layer that seals it underground, kind of the same way that oil is sealed underground for millions of years. We can basically reverse that and put CO2 underground um, and seal it there forever. And so this technology, um, I call it sedimentary basin storage, because you're taking advantage of structures that are in sedimentary basins. Um, and basically even for a, a thousand or so years, the major trapping mechanism is um, just structural or what's called residual trapping, meaning that it, CO2 is just stuck in the pore spaces. So it remains as pure buoyant CO2 for thousands of years. Although at some point, some of it does get geochemically trapped. Um, so now I'll talk about what that means. The other kind of like camp of geologic carbon storage is geochemical storage. So instead of just putting pure CO2 underground and trapping it there with structures, you're chemically reacting it with different stuff to convert it from a buoyant gas into a different form. Um, and how this works is that CO2, when it's it dissolved in water, or exposed to enough water, it um, dissolves into the water, kind of like soda water um, or Perrier. And this CO2 dissolved in water can stay trapped there for thousands of years if the pH of the solution is high enough. And the thing that raises pH of water is when certain types of minerals dissolve, like the minerals present in basalt or peridotite, which we'll hear about today. Um, and eventually this kind of geochemical trapping with aqueous phase, meaning you're putting CO2 in water, um, leads to the precipitation of carbonate minerals or mineralization, which I think we've all heard of. Um, so in this scenario, you're essentially reacting CO2, water, and some silicate mineral um, to form stable carbonate minerals. So you're transforming CO2 from a gas, 
then to liquid, then to a solid carbonate mineral. Um, so that's what I mean by converting it chemically into a different form. Um, so yeah, just to review, there's kind of the pure phase sedimentary basin storage, which is older, more traditional geologic storage that's done in oil and gas industry. Um, and then there's a novel form of geochemical carbon storage where you're dissolving it into water and precipitating stable carbonate minerals, which most of us here um, are experts in. So these two things are, are in situ, meaning putting CO2 in the ground under rocks. Um, so hopefully that, that kind of provides an overview of a background on the different types. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Sylvan and we can start discussing uh, pros and cons, yeah. whatnot. This is great. Thank you very much, Claire, for this uh, introduction and overview of the different processes. So first, maybe I would like to ask our panelists uh, to introduce themselves uh, quickly, but you can also add uh, a little bit on what you're doing uh, with respect to CO2 storage. So on my screen, Karen goes first. So if you may. Everybody, I'm Karen. I'm the co-founder and chief commercial officer of 4401. We are a mineralization company that focuses on storing carbon dioxide permanently in the subsurface in specifically peridotite geological formations, which is an ultramafic rock that's found uh, abundantly across the world, but has certain outcrops on the surface. Uh, particularly a large outcrop is in Oman and the UAE. So our initial operations are focused on um, injecting CO2 into the subsurface in Oman, in particular, where we are based. Um, we're currently at a pilot stage and are ramping up for towards commercial injections uh, early next year. Great to meet you all. Thank you, Karen. Uh, perfect. Uh, then goes Kari, please. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Kari Helgeson. I'm head of research and innovation at uh, Carbfix. Um, Carbfix uh, turns CO2 into stone underground uh, via uh, mineralization um, in subsurface basalts. So this method was developed here in, in Iceland and went through the, the uh, pilot and, and research phases. And, and uh, we have been injecting CO2 uh, industrially since 2014 at our, uh, had to say, the power plant site. Um, so we've, uh, so, so yeah, basically, um, what I do is project development, uh, strategy, and overseeing uh, re the research and development projects of, of, of Curfix. Awesome, thank you, Gary. And then Julio Friedman, please. Sure, I think many of you know me already. I'm the only Julio Friedman out there. Um, I have personally put 10 million tons of carbon dioxide underground. I've been in the field of carbon storage for 20 years. I've written 70 papers and articles on it. Uh, and I've managed the Department of Energy program uh, that included the regional CCS partnerships, uh, which focused on geological storage in the uh, United States and Canada. Um, I have done geological assessments of CO2 storage. I have fielded monitoring technology and I helped the EPA devise class six well co codes. So I know things about stuff and I'm here to help you all today. This is great. Thank you very much, Julio. And so to start with, so uh, to the audience, don't, do not hesitate to post uh, your question on the chat. Uh, Jason will be paying, paying attention to them. Um, so first of all, um, to build on Claire's uh, introduction, I think if I am a company capturing uh, carbon and uh, CO2, uh, and I want to get rid of this, uh, so I have those first two options that Claire mentioned. Uh, but one point I want also to mention and to ask the panelists on is um, the different, the roles of the, those massive geologic reservoir we were talking about versus more decentralized uh, small volume approaches, like for example, mineralizing uh, the CO2 in concrete products. Uh, and maybe uh, how you see those two uh, uh, we could say uh, approaches uh, evolving and, uh, and, and the, the role they could play with respect to the different companies we see launching uh, on capture. I don't know who wants to go first on this one. Yeah, Julio, please. Sure. So let's get something straight at the start. This is not an end of life custody issue. If you do not have CO2 storage, you have nothing. You do not have a project, you do not have anything investable. 
If you do not have CO2 storage, you have nothing. So it's important to get that right out of the gate. It's particularly important because it takes a long time to permit many of these things. It's not necessarily that way with cement or mineralization, but if you're doing deep geological disposal of CO2, it can take as much as seven years from a white sheet of paper to fill the facility. So important to know that going in. This, uh, there, we are not running out of resource. Just saline formation resource worldwide is between 10 and 20 trillion tons of capacity. And we're pretty confident that we can get most of that. That if you include mineralization resources, it is 50,000 times larger than that. So we are not running out of the resource. However, there is a rate issue. Uh, you have to be able to manage the volumes of CO2 involved. So if you're at carb fix and you're injecting 4,000 tons of CO2 a year or 40,000 tons of CO2 a year, you're able to manage that volume. If you're at Archer Daniels Midland, you're able to manage a million tons or even 2 million tons at one site. But it is very hard to get 2 million tons a year of CO2 into concrete. If you have a point source, that will be very difficult. The volumes that are possible from distributed storage using geological storage are limited. There's just not that much of it. And I have witnessed many, many conversations where a refinery has said, hey, I got 3 million tons of CO2 here. It's pure source, ready to go. Can somebody please bring a 3 million ton a year concrete project to me? And they just don't exist. There's not such a thing. So it's important to be calibrated for volumes and time and need. Perfect. Um, yeah, I just want to add that to that point about kind of the role of the relative types with concrete and sort of what can be considered utilization and storage. Like those are kind of getting a lot of attention right now, specifically while DAC prices are so high because it's more incentivized to sell the CO2 you capture rather than just sort of looking at CDR as kind of a waste management industry um, where we're disposing of CO2 underground permanently, like Julio said. So there's a lot of incentives right now to, to sell and, and repurpose your CO2 just because of the, the prices. Um, but emission source capture to utilization pathways, like Julio said, are a little bit more mm -hmm. unclear and or unlikely. <laughs> Well, and most up. of them aren't, uh, sorry, just quickly, most of those are not storage. Mm -hmm. If you're going to concrete, they are, yeah. but if you're going to fuel, they're not. Yeah. So there's no storage involved. You may displace a fossil fuel, you may reduce emissions, you may have a good life cycle, but it is not storage, it's catch and release. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and I will just add that uh, for, for these utilization pathways, they've become very attractive now, you know, mostly because there are uh, there is a shortage of storage sites. So a lot of companies that don't have access to storage, they are now considering uh, util utilization pathways, whether it be in, in concrete or, or, or into fuels. Um, but, uh, you know, these will go hand in hand to some extent, uh, but the vast majority of the emitted carbon or the carbon that we should be capturing needs to go into a geological storage. I mean, if you were to replace all fuels of all the transport sector with uh, e-fuels made from, from captured carbon, you would be using at most a few gigatons uh, 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 per year. So, so we need to go bigger than this. And, and then in 2050, we'll be talking about maybe maybe 10 gigatons per year, but we, we need to go much, much bigger. So, so I think it's going to be, you know, either the storage site will come to you or you will have to come to the storage site. So. I can add on here one little bit. I'd also like to drill sure. down on the aspect of permanence. I think that when it comes to fuels, when it comes to usage, you are really um, bringing CO2 into somewhat of a circular economy. So the CO2 is captured, reused, but it's never actually removed. In our case, um, storage, mineralization, um, the, the ability of us to per permanently remove CO2 is where we stand apart. And I think that's really important to remember as we look at you know massive scale of storage sites that we need to focus on durability to the utmost possible. Uh, of course, specific to the geological, the geographic constraints of both uh, of point source emissions, um, and well, in the case of DAC, not as much. Uh, we need to focus on that uh, element of permanence for both. Great, thank, thank you all for those uh, inputs. 
And so Julio put the example of a large uh, CCS uh, plant capturing a lot of CO2 that uh, will definitely not be possible to mineralize in concrete. I will put the other example, like uh, let's think of those small companies, uh, I mean, not small companies, but companies capturing low amounts of carbon, like Remora, Carbon Quest, Airhive, Noya, maybe. Uh, they will have volumes that are uh, not uh, comparable to a CCS uh, on, on a power plant, for example. Is there a critical size to access a geological reservoir today or in the coming five years? That ends up being pretty sensitive to local infrastructure. And this is a, a expanding on a point that Kari was just making. Um, uh, in the United States, we are fortunate to have 5,000 miles of CO2 pipeline already. Uh, there are good looking projects to expand that, maybe add an extra few thousand miles. Uh, and in that case, if you're cl anywhere close to those things, then you have access to infrastructure. Uh, if that's the case, trucks do a fine job. You can truck CO2 from your building or from your capture set to uh, a, a pipeline. Barges work. We're getting better now at barging CO2 around. Uh, it's a little more expensive, but only a little more than, than a pipeline. So there's ways to do that. And of course, we're seeing such things develop in the North Sea. Um, at that point, there's not really a question of minimum size. There's a question of minimum price. You have to make sure the, the full integrated capture costs reflect that all in cost. Uh, but that is required on being close to that infrastructure. If you are not close to that infrastructure, then you need to create your own project. Realistically, anything less than a half million tons just isn't going to fly. It's very, very hard to uh, conscience the costs associated with CO2 storage at small volumes. You really need to get to a big scale for it to, for the economies of scale to materialize. I think I'll maybe add to this, that uh, when you compare mineralization, uh, subsurface mineralization to classical uh, CCS injection of, of, of supercritical CO2, I mean, the, the entry barrier for the, the minimum size is much, much lower because we have lower capacity wells, we, we inject to shallower depths, and, uh, and uh, well, we rely on multiple shallow injection wells rather than one single ginormous, very expensive injection wells. So um, I think a lot of the attraction for subsurface mineralization is that, you know, medium sized emitters are now able to uh, actually uh, access storage. For example, I mean, our power plant emits something like um, 40,000 tons per year, which is not a lot, but it's still, you know, we are able to run the whole CCS chain there at about 25 to $30 per ton. Um, so, and then about the, the, the infrastructure, uh, trucking and, and, and shipping CO2, um, I mean, we, we are establishing a, a large project here in Iceland called the Kota Terminal Project, in, in which we, we are planning to ship large volumes of CO2 from Northern Europe, uh, captured from industrial point sources in North Europe. But however, we, we are also uh, shipping uh, containers this year from, from Switzerland. So, so this is Switzerland is very much inland in Europe, have very limited access to storage resources. And, uh, and this is a proof of concept project for you know, these uh, very early uh, transport infrastructures. So we will actually use the, the CO2 transported from, from uh, Switzerland for our seawater injection pilot. So this is you know, carb fix injection, um, validating it using seawater instead of freshwater. Um, so, so please follow that. But, uh, but I, I, I think the, the um, especially mineralization is, is opening uh, up uh, a lot of opportunities for, for small and medium sized emitters, but you will always have to be lucky enough to be sitting on top of, you know, favorable bedrock for this. I'd just like to add that mineralization uh, as a form of storage is particularly attractive to direct air capture companies, particularly for that small scale region. Uh, reason. Uh, direct air capture for the moment is relatively smaller scale. So we're able to basically build sinks that can, that can enable them to scale up, uh, enable them to uh, uh, store smaller amounts of CO2 in the hundreds or even or thousands of ton range instead of the millions or half millions that traditional storage infrastructure requires. So in that way, it's really beneficial as a combination for both technologies to scale up together. Great, thank you. Um, so as uh, Julio explained it in the very beginning, 
uh, on paper, we are not limited for uh, with capacity and for storage. There is quite a lot out there uh, between saline aquifers and mineralization uh, opportunities. But then what about the operational capacity today? Uh, and let's say in the coming five years again, how do you see the pipeline uh, of uh, CO2 storage project, uh, I, I mean, uh, geological storage projects? And also what type of companies could be uh, players in that field? Because um, CapFix and 44.01 are interesting examples of uh, storage companies built on uh, uh, technological innovation, which is uh, subsurface mineralization. Uh, but then uh, one might uh, ask about the, the other uh, reservoir like saline aquifers, who will deal with uh, those? Um, so yeah, who, who wants to go first on, on this one? Julio, Claire, maybe? Sure, uh, happy to. So last year, 130 projects were announced for large scale carbon storage uh, and carbon capture. Um, the current uh, volume that's being injected underground is 40 million tons a year. Uh, and we are likely to increase that above 100 million tons if uh, some fraction of those projects are completed, not even necessarily all of them. Um, uh, the skill set that is developed in oil and gas industries for drilling wells, completing them, and monitoring the subsurface, assessing reservoirs, all of that stuff, uh, these uh, skill sets are abundant in the marketplace. Uh, there are enormous numbers of skilled workers and drill rigs ready to go. And a number of commercial companies, uh, ranging from Oxy Low Carbon Business Ventures to Baker Hughes, are getting into that business with the explicit idea that they will be a carbon services company, that they will manage the waste volumes associated with CO2 for fun and profit. And uh, so far that seems to be going well. Um, it is the case that unsurprisingly that skill set and the resource are all in the same general place, which is traditionally where there's a bunch of oil and gas. That means that in places where there's a great sale and formation storage, but not a lot of oil and gas, like central Illinois, for example, uh, you're, you're a little bit more limited on the human capital and the drill rigs and such things. But even there, uh, there is expertise and knowledge that can be brought to bear on it. Um, and the same thing is true uh, for the mineralization cases. Uh, I won't speak to them because Karin and Carrier are, are better equipped. But again, people who've been working geothermal fields for a long time have the skill set necessary to do this job. Cool. Anyone, anyone want to, to add on this? Oh, I can maybe just um, add that I, I think uh, Julio is absolutely right. That it is the skill set and the machinery and, and the infrastructure. Everything is, is uh, you know, sort of born out of oil and gas. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's kind of hard for, you know, new, smaller, innovative companies to enter this space um, since they're all, all already related to, to oil and gas. Um, but the, the question remains in, you know, how much the, the uh, oil and gas sector will actually, you know, provide uh, this, this type of services. But it's, it seems like it's happening, but, uh, but probably not uh, very accessible to, to smaller companies, but, but there are some. Yeah, yeah I think jumping in. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Claire. It might um, depend on any type of legislation, and Julio can probably speak more to this of his experience with, with the DOE, but in the US specifically, like um, there might come a time when oil and gas companies, assuming that we will unfortunately continue to, to burn fossil fuels for at least the next couple of years, um, are incentivized to get rid of their own CO2, in which case some of that um, sedimentary basin storage capacity, which many it, oil and gas companies already might own and operate as it is, um, they'll be kind of incentivized to take that up to get rid of their own CO2, which would maybe even further limit what Carly was saying about, about having this storage be accessible to smaller DAC companies. But that being said, the, the capacity is massive, as, as Julio mentioned. So this wouldn't by any means be a bottleneck. It just might kind of delay um, this like sedimentary basin plus DAC storage. And um, I think that it was also Kari or maybe Karan who mentioned that um, that mineralization is quite attractive to DAC companies. And I think that that is in part because in the CDR world, I have kind of 
picked up on a general sentiment amongst at least some people, specifically some DAC companies that um, the CDR industry should kind of stay far away from oil and gas. And, and some people believe that oil and gas companies shouldn't be kind of allowed to profit off of the carbon removal industry. Although I personally think that that's um, a little bit unrealistic because of the overlapping expertise. Um, but that definitely is a kind of prevailing sentiment at the moment um, that is pushing these smaller DAC companies towards mineralization. Um, Karan, over to you. I just wanted to double click on the on the resources part. So in our region in particular, as you all know, it's a heavy oil and gas um, region. And what we're seeing is that there's actually a lot of tools that we and resources and people that we can actually repurpose entirely for to focus on carbon removal. Um, and uh, there is a general uh, decline that we're seeing in in oil and gas in, in in the region. And there's basically a lot of infrastructure, uh, tools, equipment, and people. Uh, that are that are looking to switch into climate focused industries. So we're really fortunate to be able to grasp and capture a lot of that those resources to repurpose into what we're trying to do is basically put instead of taking hydrocarbons out, we're putting the CO2 back in using very similar uh, processes. Cool, thanks. That's encouraging to, to hear. Um, now I want to, to switch to a topic that uh, immediately uh, appear in the discussion. For example, if I talk to my friends or family about CO2 storage, they would immediately uh, ask me about safety, the safety of the storage. And this links also to the permitting processes uh, to open new reservoirs, the time it takes, and also the social acceptance of this kind of projects, because we all know that in the past there have been uh, some bumps uh, on the road of CO2 storage uh, in the underground. So yeah, I would like to have your, your take on, on, this, uh, on these important issues, especially because uh, companies that are uh, working on CO2 storage may not be able to solve them on their own. Right, so let me get into this quite strenuously because there is a great deal of misinformation and false information out there on this stuff. So I'm gonna make a couple of quick declarative sentences here uh, for your audience so that they understand. First of all, the earth is well configured to store CO2. If you have a good storage site, it holds CO2 indefinitely, the risk of a return is effectively zero. Second of all, we have injected over 400 million tons of carbon dioxide underground for 50 years. The safety record is perfect. There has been no release, there has been no harm. Nobody has been hurt, period. There have been cases like the Satorsha case in Mississippi where a surface pipe ruptured and that surface pipe contained hydrogen sulfide and that hydrogen sulfide caused health problems. In carbon capture systems, there is no hydrogen sulfide, so that's not a risk. And again, the safety record of 50 years of operation is exemplary. It is very, very good. If you choose a good site, the CO2 will stay underground. The 10 trillion tons of conservative storage that I talked about before are considered to be good sites. So we, are, we have the volumes to do this and they are likely to, to work well indefinitely. Um, and so, you know, the, it, it, people have in their minds, and this is not anybody's fault, it's just the way it is, people have in their minds a Hollywood version of this stuff. They imagine that the earth will burst like a bubble and huge volumes of CO2 will vent all at once like that is flatly not possible. The Earth's crust has mass. The Earth's crust has strength. I have tried to move a kilometer of the Earth's crust. It's very, very hard to do. Um, the one thing that you really do need to watch for is wells. Wells are a place where you punch a hole through all that Earth's crust. And so the reason you do punch holes is to move fluids around. So it is a place where there are risks and those risks are substantial. They are also manageable. We have hundreds of years of technology to drill and complete wells. And we have examined this for 25 years in great detail. And in fact, even old wells generally are improve their performance over time when exposed to CO2 and that they store CO2 better, not worse. That is also true for reservoir. Over time, most reservoirs improve their performance over time and the storage site gets better. In the case of mineralization, it's even better than that because the CO2 turns to rock in a couple of years. 
at which point the only way to get the CO2 out of the ground is plate tectonics. So uh, the, the, these are incredibly, incredibly safe operations uh, and demonstrably so. Yeah, I, I uh, sort of just, uh, yeah, I echo what Julio, Julio said, they, they are both extremely, extremely secure and, uh, and we employ a lot of uh, safety and, and, and backup and measurements at our, our, uh, at our site uh, in, in Iceland. Um, I think this is more of a, like a communication challenge uh, rather than a technical challenge. It's, a, it's, a, it's to uh, disseminate uh, to the public and, and explain. Uh, it's in, uh, hopefully, uh, we can all do so in such a way that Julio just did. Uh, so, uh, but but uh, yes, we we have had the the. Um, the benefit of, of being more linked to geothermal. I mean, we are born out of geothermal rather than oil and gas. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the problems that conventional carbon capture and storage has had is, is that it's linked with, with oil and gas and people just, you know, simply have more mistrust of that sector. Um, but uh, but it's, uh, it's simply, you know, a, a communication challenge about the, the, the leakage and the safety and the permanence of these, these storage reservoirs. So hopefully some of the, you know, people in the audience can sort of help, you know, uh, distribute the message. Yeah, something that helps like illustrate how well we are able to keep buoyant phases underground once we poke a hole in those reservoirs, like Julio said, it is just the extraction of oil and gas. Like if we think about how, well maintained and how like intricately designed um, that like specific rigs to pull oil out are once they kind of drill in oil isn't just flying everywhere out the surface these wells are very high tech high tech and have been tested and tried for many many years and um and yeah as kari said it is mineralization definitely has a, a more perceived um permanence because of the Carb fix, how they demonstrated that it turns to stone and you can literally see it. People respond really well to that. Um, but I just want to underscore that that is kind of a perception um, and not reality and not true. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I guess that, that, yeah, definitely the challenge is to bring that message to the general public. I don't know how it looks in your respective countries, but uh, in France and in Europe, overall, the conversation is pretty poor on those topics. I mean, in the general media, you know, and uh, still, I would say most NGOs tend to be against this kind of project. Uh, uh, so, so it is a real challenge, and I guess uh, something has to be done at a higher level than just the companies. Uh, so that's government, and that's general general communication. Um, so. Great. Um, maybe the, the, the next question could be, can we go through the key metrics uh, you want to track to assess the performance of a CO2 storage project? So again, I, I want to make clear, a lot of this information is very readily available and easy to find. So for your audience, a couple of things. One, wrote a report on the returning CO2 to the geosphere. You can find it here in the chat function. You should also go to the Global CCS Institute website that talks a great deal about the kinds of metrics and tools and processes that we have in place. They have written many, many reports on the topic, fact sheets, et cetera. Same thing with the Department of Energy. Same thing with the International Energy Agency's Greenhouse Gas Control Group. Um, same thing with the International Energy Agency as a whole. There's just an awful lot of information out there. So I would encourage everyone to uh, familiarize yourself with this. Uh, it is actually easy to find and easy to read. Uh, the punchline is that the way, if you don't have monitoring, you don't have anything. And so the key metric is, you know, do you have enough volume to store the CO2? Uh, are the rocks well configured to sustain, to contain it? And then can you monitor it? And the answer again, in most cases is yes, we can monitor it pretty well and use different tools for different locations. For the kind of uh, work that Karin is, is putting forward, you're mostly gonna be using some kind of geochemical monitoring approach. Uh, in the case of storing CO2 in a saline formation, you'll be using mostly different kinds of geophysical approaches, things like above zone pressure monitoring or something like that. Um, but these tools are very well established. 
uh, when I was when I left the DOE, we I think identified 120 different monitoring approaches and tools that you can use, uh, and these are all reasonably cheap and available. Generally speaking, on the context of a large project, a multi-million ton a year injection project, the cost of monitoring is tens of cents per ton. It's cheap. Um, and so very straightforward uh, to do. And uh, uh, even in Europe, but certainly in North America, there is a good regulatory framework for this stuff. So the primary metric is, are you in regulatory compliance? Because if you are, you're doing a good job. And if you're in regulatory compliance, whether it's a class six well or a class two well with the EPA, or whether you're following Denmark's or the Netherlands guidance for managing a subsurface reservoir, if you're in regulatory compliance, you're doing a good job. And that's a way to guarantee that again, it's performing as advertised, that the CO2 is going down and staying down. Great, any additions to this? Gary Karan, do you want to, to, to describe quickly how you, you monitor and you, you verify that your process is working? I mean, sure. I mean, uh, I mean the, the, the way we do it is, is uh, like Julio said, mostly a, a geochemical uh, approaches. And uh, we're continuing to develop even more approaches to make them sort of uh, agree amongst one another. Um, we sort of play a game of detective. We, we, we uh, co-inject uh, a tracer material uh, in, into the, with the fluid that we inject, the sparkling water, essentially. And then we sample nearby monitoring wells and, and we can calculate how much of the CO2 is actually going into the minerals and how quickly it's actually uh, mineralizing. So the, the big advantage of this, of course, is, is that you, know, you, you don't have to worry about what happens 10, 20, 30 years into the future. Once you've verified that it's actually, you know, turned into stone and mineralized, you can simply walk away. So, so I think uh, it has the, the benefit of, of you know, long-term liabilities. Um, so so that, that, is, that is, of course, um, um, something good. I, and, I, and I think maybe we, we should also be talking about like, you know, different, different CDR approaches. So carbon removal approaches. So this is, you know, when we're talking geological storage, this is where, you know, the the storage, uh, the the last link of the of the CCS chain where we shine in terms of, of, of carbon storage. Whereas, you know, for some of the nature-based approaches, these can be associated with very high uncertainties, uh, low permanence, for example, etc. So, uh, so uh, yeah, my son is calling. So let me let me uh, pivot to to uh, Karan or, or Claire. <laughs> Hold on. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, do you want to add yeah. on this, or then we can open to the to the question of the public? Yeah, Karen. Um, just just wanted to add one point um, on the verification part. So there are you know multitude of standards that are now coming out to develop methodologies uh, for all forms of carbon removal. In in our case, for mineralization, it is pretty early still. So what? Um, 401 we are doing alongside Carfix and on many occasions is trying to contribute to that dialogue to try to be as transparent as possible in developing uh, uh, methodologies to verify our own processes so that when we do couple with any forms of carbon storage that information is very very transparent uh, so we want to that that is it and, and we want to be as uh, clear as possible that um, we are removing that co2 uh, permanently great Great, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for those answers. So now I think it's time to open uh, the discussion to the to the the, the audience. So uh, I think uh, Logan Munoz has a question and he would like to ask it. Logan, if you can unmute. Hey, so I had the question that I was asking, what is the energy requirement to compress and inject CO2 gas or maybe some of our these other um, BEX products into these sedimentary basins? So the, go ahead, Claire. <laughs> it's about 75 kilowatt hours of electricity demand to compress CO2 to a, a liquid supercritical state, um, which it, like as Julio kind of mentioned is definitely pennies on the dollar when you consider the cost of, of drilling well two kilometers deep, especially like a, a high tech, more expensive well that has to keep the CO2 pressurized on the way down relative to um, the carb fix method that doesn't um, those wells aren't required to be as to be pressurized like that. Um, 
So yeah, but again, this like very a drop in the bucket compared to the energy requirement for capture, which is about 2000 kilowatt hours per ton um, of CO2. So hopefully that answers your question. Well, again, this to, to that, that is for air capture. For uh, point source capture is a whole lot less than 2000 kilowatt hours per ton. Um, and that varies actually quite a bit by point source, by concentration, by technology, all these other sorts of things. But, but it is still the case that uh, the energy costs are real, but modest, even if you're doing point source capture. Um, you are injecting CO2 as a liquid or as a supercritical phase, so you have to pay for that, but uh, it's the cost to do in business and it's a modest cost on the enterprise. Great, Th thank you for the answer. I, I think um, we can ask to Alicia Fredrickson. Uh, do you want to ask your question yourself? Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, and I, I think there's a similar question oh. above as well, um, but it's really about the, the nature of the challenges that we've been facing to date and also upcoming. I think curious about what the main hurdles have been to scaling storage volumes so far. Is it you know lack of transport infrastructure? Is it mismatch between capture that's affordable and storage locations, etc.? Oh, this is actually really straightforward. Go, but go ahead, Carrie, you first. Yeah, uh, just very short. Uh, I would say it's a lack of market. Yes, we haven't paid for it. That's the problem. Until we pay for it, no one's going to do it. Engineers don't work for HUDs. <laughs> and and I'm, I mean, just it, it, if you're emitting, it has to cost something. And we need, you know, government support and uh, and a lot of support actually to actually just create the market. So there's a, there's mm. we, we have something like this in, in Europe now called the, the EU emission trading scheme in which, you know, if you're a specific industry, you have to pay if you're emitting. So and and uh, the ETS allowances have been very low the past ten years, and nobody has done anything really, or or very very limited, uh, especially in the CCS space. Now it's up to ninety euros per ton, and uh, suddenly we're seeing a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. let, let me expand on that just a bit. Uh, the wind production tax credit came in at between sixty and one hundred and twenty dollars a ton. The energy vendor came in between $300 and $500 a ton. We're currently subsidizing batteries at $1,200 a ton in California. Like, like we pay for all kinds of stuff. Right now, if you're in the US, you get $50 a ton for saline formation. If you're in Europe, you get penalized for emitting. That's the full market. It is also the case that we are looking at new draft legislation in the US, which is looking at something more like $85 a ton. At $85 a ton, you actually quintuple the volume of storage. You, you go from basically 20 million tons to well over 100 million tons. And if you did direct pay, you get 400 million tons of storage. And that would basically, because that amount of money, $85 with direct pay, is enough to pay for the infrastructure. It's enough to pay for the compression. It's enough to pay for the wells. It's enough to pay for the pipelines. It's enough to get the job done. At $50 a ton, it's not. So you just need to close that gap. Um, but at $85 a ton, that's basically about the same as the wind production tax credit. Great. Uh, thank you for those answers. Um, I think Jason has a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking along the lines of Alicia's question about what's holding the industry back. And knowing that we have uh, quite a number of uh, people who are innovators in the, in the space, in the, in the audience today, people who maybe on the sidelines trying to figure out like, how do I apply myself to this uh, you know, growing carbon removal industry? If you wanted to start a carbon storage organization company today, what would be the challenges that you would feel like they could apply to with, uh, apply their efforts to with the highest degree of impact? Knowing that we you know, certainly have, you know, we've got 441 in the, in the, in our panel and carb fix represented in our panel, but, uh, you know, it, there are kind of, you know, baby 4401s or baby carb fixes perhaps uh, watching this today. Um, you know, what are, you know, what, what will be the, the challenges and the opportunities to keep in mind? I think one of the, our big, big challenges, uh, at least, you know, going outside of Iceland internationally is the uncertainty in the policy framework. So, you know, you, you never know exactly how, 
how long time it takes to actually permit a well or permit a project. So, so that is something we worry about quite a lot, which is why we have, you know, uh, established most of our flagship projects here in Iceland because we we sort of understand the regulatory framework, helped write some of it, and uh, you know there are short communication pathways. So, um, I mean that that I, I think most of the the problems that you would face are human made problems, sort of regulatory permitting, uh, etc. I think. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, financing, uh, I think uh, investors are, are are finally you know coming on board uh, with respect to carbon capture and storage projects, um, and and then um, technically speaking, um, I think well we've been doing carbon capture and storage for you know twenty to thirty years uh, commercially, so so I mean there's there's uh, there is a lot of know how uh, already. And uh, and uh, in the mineralization, we are a little bit, uh, you know, we're not as far along, um, but we we definitely need more more pilot injections going. But however, the pilot injections, uh, you know, they can serve small or medium uh, sized emitters, and they will help us answer a lot of questions that we need in order to get this 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 industry going. But uh, human-made problems are, are our biggest worries. And, and of course, the long lead time for geological storage projects. Um, it's, it's not only you know, long lead time uh, with respect to, to permitting and regulatory, but it's also you, know, you, have to, you have to do your research and validate that your reservoir does indeed store carbon. Great, Thank I'd you. like to add that. Yeah, go on, please. I'd like to add that actually sourcing CO2 can be a problem. And it really depends on where you're setting up your company. So if we have uh, emissions facilities nearby that you can easily source CO2 from, that's a, a big challenge for us. Uh, do those emissions facilities already have point source devices um, capturing CO2? And are, uh, is it readily available for us to then take and then mineralize? Um, direct air capture is relatively small right now. So how do we you know, attract those direct air capture companies to sinks? Um, and where are those locations relative to the actual points of capture. And that's going to kind of touching back on a few uh, infrastructure points made by my fellow panelists here on what is the supporting infrastructure around that can enable the fluid transport of CO2 across uh, distances and can we make that feasible? So I think there's a whole business model play uh, challenge here as well, and that everything can be very site specific. And, um, and that's really where challenges come in terms of scale. You can start in a very optimal location, but can you then replicate that, you know, two gigaton scale in the in in using the same unit costs? Probably not. So it's very very adaptable. Um, uh, it it ha needs to be adapted across different sites, and I think that's a challenge that we face, and probably most uh, storage companies would have to think about before they before they start up. Yeah, um, I just want to add on Kari's point about the human problems in terms of permitting and regulation. This kind of applies both to mineralization and uh, saline information storage, because in order to apply for a class six permit or even somewhere else in the world, kind of apply for a license to use the subsurface or whatever, you already need to know a lot about the subsurface to essentially report in your application how you're going to monitor, what you're exactly going to do, what kind of risks you might face. Um, so there's a kind of a, a high activation energy in terms of the amount of information you need up front, which costs money. So for startups um, who want to get investments to answer these questions, some investors might be like, well, we may not want to invest until we know that you'll have the permitting to work. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation where you need to either find the right partners that already have data, like um, CarbFix kind of did with the geothermal industry, um, or maybe could be done in the US with oil and gas for saline sedimentary basin storage. But um, there's just one chicken and egg after the other, because uh, there's yeah, a lot you need to know before you can even go out and put CO2 into the ground. Great, thank you for those answers. Now, I think we can still take the question of uh, Jude Abel. I think he's not able to unmute, so I will ask it myself. Jude is asking, um, to what extent do you think voluntary or compliance carbon markets are the right place to raise money? Are those too small to meet the need? Uh, or do we need more subsidies or carbon taxes? 
So you can do it with carrots or sticks. Like you can definitely, like if, if there was a $150 carbon price that was universal, we'd be doing a bunch of this everywhere. Like that's just how that would work. I already talked about it, create, increasing the incentives for 45Q uh, as one way to go about it. That would certainly do the job. Um, that's enough to get paid, at which point then you're really looking more at uh, equity capital as the way to get the job done, uh, uh, in particular growth equity, uh, or you know the big boys like Apollo or something like that, or BlackRock. <clears throat> Uh, but but in point of fact, uh, it, it, this is not really a place you raise money in the voluntary market. This is that's not. You, you, it's very hard to get the money together. One of the things that is also true in this arena, and 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 I, I ask everybody who's listening to pay attention to this next bit. If you're trying to create a project and finance it through voluntary credits or something like that. Who owns the carbon attribute ends up being real important because generally you want to do the project so you own the carbon attribute and the same people who are paying for a credit also want the carbon attribute. So it's really hard to get the money together because everybody wants the same thing. And so uh, really this is a place where compliance markets, uh, equity capital, incentives uh, are, are really the game. Clara, I cut you off earlier. You were going to say something. Apologies. Um, yeah, no, I just had a little bit of a different kind of um, interpretation of the question, which, yes, I totally agree with everything you said. We To answer the question, we, we do need subsidies and we do need taxes and we do need compliance markets. Um, but in terms of the voluntary market, not in terms, not for financing a carbon storage or carbon removal project, but just for purchasing the credits that were to be produced from a, an up and running project. Um, the voluntary market is, is huge. It's projected to be about $50 billion by the end of this decade, 2030. And in terms of companies that have already announced net zero pledges, um, that requires seven and a half billion tons of CDR per year until 2050, just to meet the needs of what people have pledged. And obviously that includes greenwashing and we don't really know if that's something that they intend to follow through on, but just kind of uh, to illustrate the size and, and the demand of, um, of carbon credits just from the voluntary market alone. I'd like to add that voluntary market really plays a role in providing commercial comforts to make projects bankable. So eventually there is gonna be a uh, shift from growth equity or equity financing to forms of debt financing if we're gonna to scale to gigaton levels. Uh, we can't do that only with equity, it's just way too expensive. So there is gonna be a debt component and that's also, of course gonna help the equity players that come in to, to, to invest in companies early um, in terms of their returns. So they won't be unhappy about it, but there will need to be uh, bankability from uh, traditional finance players with lower costs of capital that'll come in and and really put you know the hundreds of millions of dollars that we require to build out massive infrastructure for carbon removal across the world and reach that gigaton scale. So the first thing they look for is commercial comfort. Are the the projects going to be able to sell the credits that they generate? So this is where you know the voluntary market at the moment has been playing a huge part and where the compliance markets are going to be really, really uh, beneficial. Uh, in, in the US and, and globally to provide that commercial comfort as the technology risk comes down as well. Great, thank you. Thank you for those answers. I think we are reaching the top of the hour. An hour is obviously way too short to deal with this topic, but I hope we managed to provide uh, as many answers as we could to, to the audience. Uh, Jason, maybe over to you. Sure. Thanks everyone for your time and effort. Thanks to our panel, thanks to Sylvain. Uh, you know, Awesome discussion, truly. Uh, Karan, to your point, uh, Air Miners is going to have a project financing event uh, sometime uh, later on in July. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, I also put up link to our link to our next event next Tuesday, a week from today, with IPCC lead author and director at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, Bill Collins. Uh, please let us also know. Uh, what you thought of today's event? You know, was it good? Was it bad? How can we make our events better in the future? That's uh, what we would love to hear. Any kind of feedback, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, it's very important to us. Uh, lastly, uh, 
again, hope you enjoyed the conversation today. We'd love to continue the conversation on Airminer Slack. So to that end, I added a link to uh, apply to Airminer Slack. If you're in carbon removal and not in Airminers, then where are you? Uh, come on, come on in. We'd love to have you continue the conversation. Uh, so many questions, uh, too little time as, uh, as Sylvain mentioned. What I'll do is I'll collect the questions and I'll, far, I'll ask it of the panelists in email, then I'll send it to the individual asker once we receive uh, responses from the panel offline. So awesome. And with that, I'm gonna stop the recording and we'll go to our networking session. So thank you everyone. Uh, it's been great having you and we look forward to seeing you at a new new event sometime in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Thank you everyone.